Mark Alsor, Chief Economist and Global Strategist, ADM Investor Services. Good morning, Mark, and thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, Mark, first of all, let me just kick off with Mark as this is the opening bell, as I said. So I was wondering what's driving the price action today? Um, well, it's a combination of things. I mean, we, we are, uh, a lot of the equity markets are very sensitive to the oil, oil price. Uh, we um, hit some, um, what looked very much like commercial hedging around 115 on um uh, this morning and it uh, came off very very sharply that gave everyone a little bit of a boost because that implies some um, relief on the inflationary side but really the oil market is incredibly volatile um, why, why is the 115 level important well it, it is a natural level yes it would be much much higher than that before but um, that was in the extreme now um, there are orders all over the place and you could really see it on the bid ask there this morning. Um, there is some relief there. There's also some relief coming from the fact that um, issuance is, is being, credit issuance is actually being completed. Uh, we had something in the region of $15 billion yesterday and that basically puts a, a, a positive backdrop for people. Um, on the other hand, I still would uh, suggest to people that we're in a situation with yields rising because obviously of this very clear message from the Fed that um, the barring uh, a seizure in financial markets, um, they may well be more aggressive as we go forward. Um, we are still getting to the point though with short dated yields in the US at two you know, in the uh, two to two and a quarter area and seemingly headed higher, um, that uh, defensive assets actually, you know, really boring old fashioned defensive assets uh, with low volatility, inherent price volatility are becoming more attractive. Um, and, uh, you know, we're also at this other point where we have to also think about how much protection does market do markets have given all the volatility that we've got because the volatility is an in a, a core part of pricing options and people's for people's ability to hedge their portfolios doesn't really matter what we're talking about it's commodities it's bonds it's equities anything you care to think of um is much much reduced because there's only so much that one can allocate towards uh, towards portfolio hedging and when that you know the cost of hedging goes up extremely so when we get a shock and we're likely to get more shocks as we go along um so the risk is that in a downdraft there is a lot less protection in markets which in turn feeds the volatility uh, on the other side, I was wondering, I just wanted to focus very quickly on, on Fed messaging because it's extremely important. Of course, uh, um, the Fed chair, Mr. Powell, said that Fed was prepared to raise interest rates in half percentage point steps if needed to ramp down, uh, sorry, to tamp down inflation, that's for sure. And on the other side, if we take a look at a 10 year in tier uh, trade yields and of course the flattening of the yield curve, I was wondering so far, uh, the Fed said throughout, of course, the Fed press conference last week, Paul said that uh, the Fed doesn't see any risk of recession uh, until the end of 2022. But do you agree? And what is the yield curve suggesting then? Well, the yield curve and uh, above all, the euro dollar curve is suggesting that um, if the Fed's going to get more aggressive, then the risk of a recession is getting that much higher. Um, and uh, if one looks at oil prices, one has to start to think, um, and indeed other energy prices, because it, we're not just talking about oil here, we're talking about things like diesel, which is enormously short supply. We're talking about things which are going to create demand destruction. Um, you know, consumers faced with all these increasing price pressures, and we should remember that food prices are also going up. We've got wheat prices up another 3% today. Um, and we're also seeing it weighing very heavily in uh, some of the emerging market economies. We saw the Egyptian pound collapse yesterday um, and uh, the, the um, Bank of Ghana being forced into 250 basis point rate hike. So the, 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 the confidence which they have is based primarily on the idea that the labor market's going to remain very, very tight um, and that they will have some success in reining in inflation. Um, and the fact that obviously we've still got a huge amount of pent up demand to rebuild inventories um, <clears throat> uh, due to the pandemic. Um, that can all be derailed if we start to get demand destruction due to higher prices. 
And making a prediction on that front is actually extraordinarily difficult, but one has to take it into account that the risk of demand destruction is getting ever higher. Um, in final topic I'd like to touch on is what is going on of course here in Europe. We we're talking once again about a war but what we do see is that support for a European Union uh, wide ban on the purchase of Russian oil is growing inside the bloc according to uh, diplomats involved in the discussion representing a significant shift in the continent's stance toward how to represent uh, how to ratchet up economic pressure uh, on Moscow because the situation of course in Ukraine is getting uh, more difficult every single day so they are even considering a ban on, on crude oil prices, not gas prices, to be precise with our viewers. So I was wondering um, if this was about to happen despite the fact that there are um, many countries that disagree with this kind of solution. So what do you think is going to be the impact on crude oil prices? Because you just mentioned them many times in terms of, of course, inflationary pressures. Uh, right. Well, I mean, is, are they going to come to an agreement? Well, probably not, simply because um, it is something which they have to all agree upon. And we know that Mr. Orban, with his very close, close relationship um, to uh, Moscow, is probably like to veto it. On the other hand, uh, there is an alternative proposal, which actually seems to be quite sensible, uh, to impose a 100% tax on, um, it, on uh, Russian oil, um, uh, basically to get people um, to go and trade with someone else for their energy needs. Um, that creates, obviously, will create some problems um, because it needs to be transitioned probably, properly because otherwise it will just hit consumers extraordinarily hard um, in the first instance where there isn't an alternative. Um, you know, all, sourcing alternatives is, you know, it, it, it takes time. Uh, <laughs> no question about that. But that would be an alternative and that in turn probably uh, might ease some of the upward pressure on oil prices, but I would re-emphasize the point I've made many a time. The problem with oil isn't just about Russia. Yes, removing three million barrels of, a day of Russian supply is obviously a, 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 a big factor, but the oil market is very, very, very tight. And we also have in the background going on, obviously, these attacks on um, Saudi Arabian oil in, uh, installations, uh, for which they have said, Look, if these things get taken out, and they're basically also making a political point about negotiations with Iran, uh, then we're, we're not going to make up for any shortfall um, because you are the ones who are talking to Iran and they are the ones who are sponsoring the Houthis. So it's a complex situation, but we're in a situation where I think all the risks in terms of oil prices, you know, even, even in the event of a cessation of oil hostilities, which would obviously create uh, a, a short-term downdraft are to the upside simply because the, the oil market is in a very tight state and the oil product side is an even tighter state. Uh, and final take, we saw a little bit of macro data today uh, and a lot of Fed speakers, not only, of course, we also have a little bit of auctions in the U.S. I just wanted to highlight a red book year over year at 12.4% versus 12.6% previous number. Uh, I was on, uh, wondering, Mark, from economic uh, standpoint, how, how concerned are you uh, for the U.S. economy and global economy as a whole? Because we saw very different, of course, uh, macro projections that were not really uh, as positive as at the very beginning of the year yes I mean in terms of the US economy I, I still think actually um, that the underlying momentum is strong uh, wage growth is fairly strong I think in terms of Europe and it, I think the interesting survey there was the one that um, despite the rising uh, cost of living in Europe and this applies pretty much across the area people aren't really pushing too much for higher wages so that means that the incremental um, impacts on consumer spending, the, the risks to consumer spending are higher in Europe r rather than in the US. So we may see some divergence there. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I think that's sort of a, a pretty good benchmark for all of it. And we also have to keep a very close eye on out on in terms of consumer demand in China, because the Chinese authorities will need to try and rein in the inflationary pressures that they are there externally and to which they are vulnerable. Yes, they can buy in cheap Russian wheat, discounted Russian wheat, discounted Russian uh, energy supplies, but with prices rising at the rate, rate that they are, 
there is a risk, particularly given that there is a one we've already seen Chinese unemployment rise quite sharply, that that may slow. So it's a very differentiated picture across the globe, out of which, for the short term, the US comes out looking somewhat better than most of the rest. Thank you very much. Mark also, Chief Economist and Global Strategy, CDM Investor Services. Have a great day, Mark, and of course, talk to you very soon. Pleasure.